We now have our good evening, everyone. The task and honor is mine this afternoon to introduce to you our presenter for this evening's lecture. She is a teacher by profession and a Moravian. And what better person to be giving this presentation than Dr. Gardner, who is a Moravian, which is the pioneer of education and an educator who is in the um, education sector. Dr. Gardner has taught at a number of educational institutions such as Manchester High School in Manchester, Mannings and Maud McLeod High Schools in Westmoreland and the University of the West Indies and the Campion College in St. Andrew. Presently, she is the Vice Principal of Academic Services at the Bethlehem Moravian College in the cool hills of Malvern in St. Elizabeth. Dr. Gardner enjoys singing, reading, and solving puzzles and playing games in her free time. She is the wife of one husband, the Reverend Dr. Paul Gardner, and the mother of Sasha Lino, Giovanni, and Damani. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our presenter for this afternoon, Dr. Sharon Gardner. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, all good evening. It is good for you to be here with me. I'm glad I'm not alone. And I want to thank the Western District for giving me the opportunity to share with you. And so for the next 30 minutes or so, I will share with you what some, um, what, some of the ways in which the Moravian Church has been involved in education in Jamaica. And so I hope I have the chance to, to share my screen. So I'm going to, if you stop sharing, I'll be able to put the presentation so that you will, um, so that you will be seeing what I want those of you who are visual learners to be also able to see and follow. So thank you so very much. And we are going to start right away because we are going to not be spending a whole lot of time here. I have half an hour to share with you on the Moravian Church's involvement in education in Jamaica. We have been going for two centuries and we are still going. So this evening, we're going to be sharing with each other um, the role of the Moravians in education in Jamaica, the nature of the involvement and that involvement from the early years to the present. So this is just some of what I know and that I will share with you. And just to set it within a context, a context which, I, which I'm sure we all know, but just in case there's anybody who is not so familiar with the context within which education took place in the early days, because that's where we're starting, I want to just set that context for us. And so in 1494, Christopher Columbus arrived in Jamaica on his second voyage. And because he was the first European to be in Jamaica to set foot on our soil, though other peoples were there before him, and I usually say that they discovered him in Jamaica, he was lost anyway. He claimed the island of Jamaica for his country, Spain. So the Spanish people came and Jamaica was Spanish territory. And the natives at the time 
were forced into slavery. So that's kind of where history begins for us, because that's where we know um, history um, as it was written by those who have it brought down through the centuries for us. Then the British came. The Spanish people were here and claimed our country until 1655, when the British captured the island from them. And importantly, for our context, which we're sharing today, with the arrival of the British, the slave trade intensified. And, and so many Africans were stolen from their country and they were brought back here to Jamaica and were enslaved. And so they worked on plantations. So that is where we are beginning with our understanding of the how the Moravians started education here and continued education here in Jamaica. So the Foster and Barham brothers, we said that the slaves were on the plantations, they were plantation owners. And history tells us that they owned a plantation in Westmoreland and in St. Elizabeth, Mesopotamia and Bogue. And so they sent four missionaries because they wanted to bring the gospel to those who were on their plantations working. And so they sent a message to England. So the plea for the missionaries came from these two brothers and that started uh, a chain reaction. As then came the Moravians because the Moravian community in Herkut, which then was the headquarters of missionary work, came to know about the request from these brothers for people to come and bring the gospel to the enslaved in Jamaica. And so we know the history very well, and we know it. three brothers were chosen to come to Jamaica to do just that. And so they arrived in December 1754. So the Moravians came and the rich legacy of the Moravians began as far as the church and education was concerned. Now, we all know that wherever the Moravians went, not only did they bring the gospel, but education for them was always important. And so naturally when they came, that was no different. And so because they came to bring the gospel to the enslaved, education for those privileged and dispossessed was high on the agenda. And this was so because of at least one value that they placed on education. You see, the education, the, the Moravians believe in the, 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 the power of education to change. And of course, you can imagine in this particular point in, in our history with slavery, with people who they wanted to influence, bringing about change in behavior was very important for them. And so with the importance placed on education, schools began to be established that was a priority for them. And so the Moravians, having come here, set about establishing schools in the 1800s. And so began the work of the Moravians in formal education. We all know the history. The first school in Jamaica began at, at Rose Corner on the road to Alligator Pond. Land was donated for that school to be built, and the school began in 1823, which means that this is the oldest primary school, elementary then, in Jamaica. And so we are very proud as Moravians of this. And so this year, 
school is 200 years old and we are having a series of activities to mark the bicentennial anniversary of primary education in Jamaica. It started last year. We who are here would know that there was an opening service in September last year and the celebration will take it to a little over 12 months, so a little over a year, and is expected to end in December of this year. And so we are 200 years and counting and proud. So going back to that school in Rose Corner, we know also, for those of us who know that the school is no longer in Rose Corner because a politician who was impressed with the work of the Moravians then made a grant of land, a pit plot of land, 500 acres at Littitz in St. Elizabeth. And so with that, the school moved from Rose Corner to Littitz. Now, because it is a relocation, of what existed at Rose Corner. The current school there, Littitz Primary and Infant School, is considered the oldest primary school in Jamaica, is the oldest primary school in Jamaica. And we are responsible for that. And the opening service to mark the, to, to, to mark the beginning of the 200th anniversary year was held in the Littitz Moravian Church, a stone's throw away from where the school currently is. And so I know we don't all know it. So here's a little visual of the sign at the gate, Littitz Primary and Infant. And you can see the school in the background there from the gate. So that's our there are our littest primary and infant school of which we are very proud. So the Moravians came, they established schools and history tells us mainly in the Western part of the island. And there's a reason for that. We are told that it was successful and started mainly in that area because in the Western part of the island is where there was a large number of freed people. Now, why is that important? Uh, we'll get to that, but you, the history books identify some of these schools. You will notice that they are mainly in Westmoreland and St. Elizabeth, the Western part of the, of the, the island to the South. So that's where our first schools uh, started, mainly because, as we say, that is where the freed people now were. But what is significant of that? We'll talk about that in a little while. The schools were built. What did the curriculum look like? Naturally, religious instruction was a part of it. Remember, I said that the a big part of bringing religion to the peoples who were here at the time is so as to bring about change. It was, it was through religion that this was done. So religious instruction was a big part of it. And I'm sure some of us would be able to guess at what were some of the scripture passages that were very important for them in this period of slavery. And then there were the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. So the three R's defined, which defined education in those days were also a part of the curriculum of all of these schools as they tried to teach them, to educate them, but also to change their behavior through religion. There are some schools that had other things. So, you know, even today there are schools and there are schools. Geography was a part of the curriculum in some schools. So they would learn about the countries of the world, not Jamaica now, of course, you know, who cared about that at the time. 
but they learned about Europe and the other countries and to find them on the map and so on. And in that particular, at that particular time, you would you would remember and appreciate that English was not the language of the people who were being taught. And so the rudiments of English, the grammar of English were very important as a part of the curriculum. Because remember, these were Africans and children of Africans eventually who either spoke the Yoruba and the tree and the other West African languages, which were not necessarily mutually intelligible. So the Africans would not necessarily understand each other because they spoke different languages which were not mutually intelligible. And so they eventually created a Creole, which was the common language of the people, which though was lexified by English, so the words were English words, it was a different from the grammar of English. And so the rudiments of grammar was very important. And of course, the aesthetic, the singing and the sewing and the playing of musical instruments could be found in some of these schools that were, that were built. And you can imagine that those those people, there were some who benefited from these additional things and there were those that stuck with the core curriculum. So I like to talk about schools and schooling because not everyone had the same privilege of, of sitting in classes that is going to school. So let us look at what education looked like some in those days. So we had these schools built, but then there was schooling for the enslaved because schools were accessed by the children of the freed. And that's why I brought them up earlier, because that's where it was the children of the freed who could attend schools mainly because the children of the enslaved had to work all day from Monday to Friday. When then were they going to go to school? So they were educated at Sunday school mainly. They were taught to read at Sunday school. And if that was so, for these children who had to work from Monday to Friday and work on Saturday in their little plots that, uh, uh, that they had and to help with their chores on Saturdays, then it meant that they could not go to school. The content of the teaching, since they were educated at Sunday school was as you would expect of a purely religious nature. So this is what education looked like for some. So the experience for the enslaved was not identical to the educational experience of the freed. So from early, from early though, the church saw through its policies focused on education. So education for the Moravians was not haphazard willy-nilly, it was purposeful. So in 1826, the Synod of the Moravian Church passed a resolution to establish a day school at every church. If the children were going to be educated and they could not go to school Monday to Friday. There had to be a way that, that they could access education more easily. And so this res the resolution was passed, which meant that the children of the enslaved could now be more, have more of an opportunity to be exposed to learning. Because if the church had a day school, then it would have been easier distance wise and otherwise for them to be able to access education. So as I said, the Moravian church was purposeful in how it treated with education from those days. So the emancipation of slaves we know happened in 1838, but from the start of the apprenticeship system four years earlier, we had a multiplication of schools. So in 1834, 
there were 27 day and Sunday schools. Notice it's day and Sunday schools. Beginning of that emancipation period, they were attached to seven main stations, we are told, and you will notice again that they are in the Western part. We're still in those early days. So we have St. Elizabeth and Westmoreland, and now if you look, you will see St. James featuring. So that's what it looked like at the beginning when they were beginning to talk about emancipation. It hadn't happened quite yet. They were beginning to talk, beginning to talk about it. But then the numbers grew. Look at the numbers. By 1836, there were 25, and these are day schools only, not day and Sunday. And there were over a thousand children attending these schools. And 1854, the number grew to 47, and the number of students grew to over 3,000, heading towards 4,000. And by the end to, of that century, there were 76 schools. So we're noticing that there, there, there is a multiplication. Right now, there's a tripling in terms of numbers of schools from when they started in those in, in the, the early period of emancipation. So more enslaved children were afforded the opportunity by virtue of the numbers that we see, the numbers of students that are growing, they were had more of an opportunity to, act, to access schools. But then, you know, as with all things, when government policies step in sometimes, it affects in a negative way sometimes. And so in the 1890s, the government cut expenditure. Some day schools were closed and some were combined. Now, we, we are reminding us that in those days, the, the families of the enslaved children would not have been able to afford education. So if the government is not helping to pay or paying, we the, 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 the students would not be able to go to school because they were not now able to afford it. And so by the beginning of the next century, the number of schools decreased. Remember, we were up to we were up to, to nearly 80. Now we are under 60 from an enrollment of over 8,000, we're falling to below 7,000. But the Moravian church was responsible, we are told at that particular time, with other entities involved in education for just under 12% of the, of the education of the, of the school, the population in schools. So we were not doing badly at all. So the number was reduced by the end of, by about that time to just twice what it was when the church passed the resolution in the first quarter of the century. After it had already tripled, it's down now to just about half. So the government policy affected that and the numbers fell. But just about the same time the Moravian church was making strides in primary education and other big things were happening and in 1839, a training college for male teachers was established, this at Fairfield in Manchester, and it began with three students. So the Moravian Church was now, had now ventured into tertiary education. The college was very successful, but again, government policy knocked it. The government decided not to pay for new students after 1898. Again, as I said, just for the primary students, if the government is not assisting with payment for these students, they were not able financially to afford tertiary education. And so there was no cohort of new students in 1898. And there was none after that because the policy was not discontinued. And so again, the, the government policy had a negative effect on the church's ability to provide education 
this time also at the tertiary level. And so what happened is that the Fairfield Training College closed at the end of 1899. The few final year students who were there at the time were transferred to Kingston to the Michael College, which was another training college for males, and that one is still open. So Moravian Teacher Training College for males, which lasted for more than half a century, was no more. But it was not the only thing that happened. We're getting to that. But now all we have is uh, a, 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 we all we have are pictures of the glory days. So for those of us who have never seen it before, here's an aerial view of the Fairfield Training College in Fairfield, Manchester. So these were just um, all we have now are memories of that. So Fairfield began in 1839 to train male teachers, but even before its demise, other things were happening in tertiary education. So when the need for a similar college, this time to train female teachers was identified, Bethabra in Newport, Manchester was selected as the site for this college. And it began in 1861 in June, Again, with three students. I don't know, there seems to be a magic number with three, but this one began with three students, history tells us as well. This college was the Bethlehem Teachers College, which began, opened its doors to, to train female teachers in 1861. So the, the Moravian started a male trick college for, to train, a, 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 a male training college and it also started a training college for females. Now, one of the things that happened when Fairfield closed is that the resources that were usually given to Fairfield were diverted to Bethlehem Teachers College. So that college flourished and it operated from, the locate, from this location from 1861 to 1887 the Bethlehem Teachers College. But then by the end of that century, uh, Bethlehem had trained many teachers. You could find them in every school, we are told. Um, uh, and sometimes, you know, it, it happens even today. The buildings fell into disrepair. The cost to repair them was too high. And so the decision was taken to rebuild, not to, you know, repair that building, but to rebuild elsewhere. And the college opened in a new location in 1889 in Malvern in the Santa Cruz Mountains. That college is still there today. Between 1887, when it closed in, in, in Newport, and 1889, when it moved to Malvern, the students were temporarily housed at Salem in Westmoreland. And so Bethlehem Moravian College, which is what it is called today, began as a training institution for females and here, here go the Moravians again with another first, because Bethlehem Teachers College was the first college established to train females for the teaching profession. Another first for the Moravians and education. Bethlehem Teachers College has gone through changes. So in 1980, it began accepting males to be trained as teachers. So it began as a training institution for females, but it began accepting males in 1980. And in 1998, it became a multidisciplinary institution. What does that mean? We're coming to that. The name then was changed and we made sure that the Moravian was now in the name Bethlehem Moravian College, the name it holds today. So what does this multidisciplinary status mean. It still prepares teachers, but it also offers bachelor's degrees 
in other areas. So it, it trains teachers and offers bachelor's degrees in early childhood education, primary education, secondary education, but also the bachelor's of science and associate of science degrees in business administration, hospitality and tourism management, criminal justice. And so it moved from being a college to train just teachers to other disciplines, hence the multidisciplinary status that it has. So also in collaboration with Moravian University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Bethlehem Moravian Church, at Bethlehem Moravian College signed a memorandum of understanding in 2023 to offer a Master of Education in Curriculum and Instruction. So it also has a, a, a master's degree, which it offers um, with, with Moravian University. So the Moravians have been very involved in education. 33 educational institutions, and, 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 and I was a little um, conflicted there because some places say 33 primary um, institutions. And so we have, we, are, we have infant schools, we have infant departments, we have primary schools, we have primary schools with junior high departments. We have one preparatory school and we have a tertiary multi multidisciplinary institution and nearly had two. So the Moravian institutions in 2024 are found in St. Elizabeth, Manchester, Westmoreland, primarily in Clarendon as well. And we have the only preparatory school, private, that is owned by the Moravian Church in St. Andrew. We don't have any purely secondary schools, but we have junior high departments. So here are some, I chose one from each of the parishes. So here is Salem, primary and junior high from Westmoreland. And there is the Nazareth, primary and infant, this time in Manchester. And also in Manchester, we spoke about the early childhood um, institutions, Nazareth Basic School, also in Manchester, as I said. In St. Elizabeth, here's one, Springfield is there. And in Clarendon, there is Moravia. And in St. Anne, St. Andrew, sorry, is our only preparatory school, the Morris Nib Preparatory School. Then at the tertiary level, there is the Bethlehem Moravian College, lovely aerial view. So we have been very involved, deliberately so, as Moravians in education in Jamaica. It has been targeted and policy directed. And one way in which the church was deliberate in, in, in ensuring its involvement in education has been through the Moravian Advisory Committee on Education. In 1995, MACE, as we called it then, was established by a resolution of the Synod in that year. What was MACE uh, responsible for? At the time, categorizing schools into denominational schools and leased schools, updating and regulating the existing agreements with the Ministry of Education as far as land that was leased and purchased um, is concerned. And so the agreements with the ministry, because some of the schools were on lands leased by the Ministry of Education, some were purchased by the, and owned by the Moravian Church. And so we kept in touch and MACE had the responsibility of seeing to those agreements and 
and, 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 and checking on them to make sure that they were going the way that they should. They were all, MACE was also responsible for conducting feasibility studies with a view to establishing new schools. So they were always having an eye out for where they could put up new schools and also, as has been through the years, ensuring that the Moravian church's interest in the Moravian institutions is always maintained. And so MACE was established to do that and more. But in 2003, the Synod changed the name from MACE to the Moravian Education Commission, and we are all familiar with that name, I am sure. A resolution was passed at the Synod, and the, which ensured that the PEC ensures that the commission is adequately staffed with an executive officer and that it was empowered to source funds to carry out its work effectively. And so this nine member commission works today very hard to make sure that our Moravian schools are what they should be and that our interest in the school, in the Moravian schools, as the Moravian church is always maintained. So the role of the Education Commission, basically similar, but, we, but, but the, the, the Synod papers tell us that it's to advise the PEC on matters related to education, to visit educational institutions, to report and make recommendations based on what they see when they visit these educational institutions and to guide the church in identifying ways to increase participation in education. I say it again, the Moravian church's involvement in education has been deliberate, has been policy directed. It, is, it has not come by chance that we have so been so involved in education and are doing so well in education. It's not by chance. And as always, again, to ensure that the church's interest in education is maintained. And as I say, that nine member committee, the Moravian Education Commission, the MEC works very hard to ensure all, that they do all of this. So the church's involvement in education is at all levels of the education system, in early childhood, primary and junior high, in the, at the tertiary level in teacher training and at the tertiary level with associate degrees and bachelor's degrees in other areas besides teaching. And also through skills training through our service agency of the Moravian Church, Unitas of Jamaica. And so the church's involvement has been very widespread, has been very comprehensive over the years. And the involvement continues. The, we, we are members of the ancillary staffs of these Moravian institutions. We are members of the administrative staffs of these institutions. We are teachers and lecturers of the academic staff of, at all levels, from the early childhood level through to primary and the secondary and the tertiary. We are administrators. We are principals in many schools. We are vice principals in many schools. We are chairpersons of the boards of the academic institutions owned by the Moravian church and some not owned by the Moravian church too. We are members of the board. Do I sound proud? Yes, I am. We are all these things as we are involved in education in the nation. And I am a teacher. I give homework as I end my presentation. And of course, oh, we also educate in, second, in, in Sunday schools. So at that level, we are also very much involved. But I'm a teacher, I give homework. And so I ask you, if I am not yet involved in education, how can I 
as a Moravian be involved and how others are involved, are already involved, can give us uh, a, 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 an idea of how we can become involved. So we can take our cue from them. So as I close, I want us to think the Moravians yeah, over yeah. the years have been proud Sorry, in yeah. becoming so involved in the Moravian church. How can uh, how can we become involved? What can we do? We can support the activities organized by the institution by attending these activities, by participating in these activities. As Moravians, we can volunteer to conduct devotions at the various institutions owned by our church. As Moravians, we can contribute financially to activities and projects of the various institutions. As Moravians, we can offer scholarships to students. And if we don't offer scholarships to students, we can offer financial help to students who struggle with lunch money, who struggle with transportation, and who struggle with just the resources to benefit as best as they can from their education. As Moravians, we can be mentors for students. As Moravians, we have skills that we can contribute to education. Some of us, for example, have proposal writing skills and project writing skills. We can volunteer them for those institutions that have projects or that we see could develop a project because we on the outside are, are can become involved, purposeful, direct. And so brothers and sisters, I ask you, if you are not involved in education as a Moravian, here are some ways that you can become involved. Those of you and us who are involved continue to do so as we share in these ways and more. Brothers and sisters, there is so much more to education in Jamaica as far as Moravian involvement is concerned. But for these li little over half hour, I share this with you and thank you for the opportunity for sharing. And I now turn over to those who are going to continue after I have finished speaking. Thank you so much, my brothers and my sisters. Very good, very good. Lord, we thank you, God, that she's alive. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Gardner. That was an excellent presentation. A lot of information. And we really are thankful for your reminding us and enlightening us on the rich history of the Moravian Church in education, past and present and continuing. We will have we will allow for some questions. Um, for persons who want to ask questions, we ask that you raise your hand and we'll indicate accordingly. I'm seeing one here from, is this Reverend Brown? No, no, is no. Gail? No, that is Brother Gail. Okay. <laughs> Brother Gil, Brother Gil is the one with his hand up. Yes, sir, Gil. Good evening. Good, Good evening. evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Is this Rev? <laughs> um, is it? Is is her last name Gardner? Is she Rev as well, or just? No, no, I'm Sister Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. I'm trying to go first because I have another meeting soon, but 
excellent presentation. I really love it. I appreciate the history and um and the enlightenment on on how how much you know the impact of you know something we need to be proud of, obviously. And at the end, you he challenge us with some actions and how we can continue the legacy of the Moravian Church by you know doing some stuff as well. But you know, I'm a student of history as well, Sister Sharon, and I I I know I, I know a couple of things up front when you when you when you started the presentation that I I can't help but ask you to quiz you in few further. I know I have some more work to do on it, but I wanted to ask you, Z, you mentioned earlier that the 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 there was a request. Um 1754 was when 1754 when the first Meridian came to Jamaica on the request. And I you said made on a request. I was, I, my, my, I, was gonna, I made a note to ask you um who made the request and why was the request made? I I I noted later on in the presentation though, you said it was, and correct me if I'm wrong, you said something about they needed to change the behavior. Um I my my interpretation, um, I'm thinking from from prior to this presentation was that it was more about uh, more about spreading the gospel uh, in, uh, uh, with the ultimate goal of saving saving souls. Um, but I noted you said it was supposed to change the behavior. Um, so could you explain that a little bit for me? And I was still want to know though who made the request uh, for the Moravians to come to, to Jamaica. Thank you very much for that. Um, so, so in the presentation, I had said that the Barham and Foster brothers who owned plantations, one in Mesopotamia, one in Bogue, made the request for the Moravians to come to bring the gospel to the people on their plantations. Um, there are a number of things that we're told about, you know, the, and you can read the history about the, the, the Moravians on the on the the, 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 the the plantations owned by the slaves on the plantations owned by the Moravians. But they, yes, wanted the wanted the uh they wanted the the the, 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 the people on their plantation to learn about the gospel. So yes, that was the primary goal. But one, one, one of the things that history tells us is that the Christianity and, and religion changes how you behave. Now remember, these were, the, these, were, these were enslaved people. They were free and happy and lovely and carefree in Africa. Then they were bundled up and taken, put in chains and made to work. Many of them were rebellious. We know the history of Jamaicans. We're told that the Jamaican, the Jamaican enslaved people were some of the most rebellious. So when we talk about changing behavior, um, that's what that's that's what that's what history tells us that that's one of the aims in 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 bringing the gospel to them. But yes, they were very they, they wanted to they wanted to 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 get the slaves to learn about God, to learn about, about Christianity. And the, these, these brothers on the plantation, we mentioned them because they were Moravians, which is how when they sent to England for help for missionaries to come, that the Moravian, the, 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 the missionary work in Hernhood, the missionaries in Hernhood heard about it because that was that was where the, the, the people would come from to these various areas of the new world, as they called it. So we talk about behavior, and I, and I was a little, I was a little um, mischievous when, when I made the presentation, because we know that the Bible has some parts about um, slaves, um, you know, masters and slaves, and slaves obeying the masters and so on. When we think about, about it in that context, we, we we know when we talk and when we talk about change in behavior, that's kind of what we, we we are looking at. So so Christianity 
um, was supposed to help these enslaved people to be better slaves. Yes, to learn about God and others, but to be better slaves. I hope that 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 you're making the I, I have answered the question adequately. Oh, sorry, I thought somebody else was coming in. Um, yes, you have, but I think I think I have some more work to do because I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit, you know, I I have a I have a I get a little bit emotional when we talk about history and what happened to my four parents and so on, sister. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a little bit queasy just about the fact that he was a slave owner um, who was enslaving all four parents who actually made the request because. Um, yes, it sounds like they wanted to bring, uh, they wanted to spread the word of Christianity, but also to to, to just control this re these rebellious Jamaicans, you know. Um, but as I say, I, I obviously have more work to do on that. But I wanted, I still appreciate the fact that you, 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 you know, you, the, 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 you, you used to really spread out, outline the history from from way back coming up and more importantly how we are where we are now because of because of education because of of what the work that they have done the, what, whatever their intent were whatever it is but we have come we're at a place now where we are at a much you know we are more enlightened and um you know our people now are in all different spheres of society because of the same education that were that was pushed that was um in part engineered by the Moravians, you know? So I, I kind of take it both ways, but as I said, more work for me. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. So out of that experience where we came to share Christianity, came the sharing of education. And that's, that's, a, that's, that's at least one good, good, good part of it. Thank you so much for your question, Brother Gail. Another question for you, Dr. Gardner. It was placed in the chat. What are the current names of Bog and Mesopotamia? Bog is Bog is, is still called Bog. It's in St. Elizabeth, still is. And the Mesopotamia is a, a, a part of the Froome property in Westmoreland. So the name changes have happened. And I'll tell you, um, brothers and sisters, I there are so many other people who would be very, very, uh, who would be better than me with the history part of it. Um, so, but, but as far as I know, Bogue is still there. As a matter of fact, I have relatives in Bogue still. Um, and 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 Mesopotamia isn't called that anymore, but I'm made to understand that it's a part of the Froome property out there in Westmoreland. And for those of you who know the 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 the, the, the history, if you can help and see hear me talking nonsense, just chip in. <laughs> um, Reverend Gardner, I I lived on Froome Estate for many years. But I never heard the name Mesopotamia, so maybe that was a part of the history. I lived there from 1957 till 1976. As, uh, um, a number of these, a number of these um, places have changed the names, and um, because I was focusing on the education part of it, and because I am not, I don't know everything about the history. I am not exactly sure about these, where these places are located, but that I know is what the history tells us that they were, that Mesopotamia, I don't know any place called, I don't know that there's any place called Mesopotamia now in 2024 in Westmoreland, but certainly in those times, there was a, a, a plantation um, called Mesopotamia in Westmoreland. So it would have gone through name chain, but it would have been, one of those um, sugar plantation areas in, in Westmoreland. Okay, thank you. You are welcome. Are there any more questions for Dr. Gardner? Yes. Um, 
this is a proud no. this is a proud son of fairfield Aha. And, yes and i i i enjoyed the um, the lecture dr gardner well done but as a proud son of fairfield i have a question because i visited there last september and um i visit the school and visited with the principal and found that the uh, basic school has been closed for quite some time. And the children have to travel long distances to find the basic school. And so she said she has been trying very hard with the ministry, with the church and everybody to see if the basic school could be open. And as I listened and heard about MACE, I wondered if this is something that MACE could look into because Fairfield is such a historic place that um, in, in the education history of Jamaica that, you know, not having a basic school there, um, um, I know it's quite a need for that. So I was just wondering if these are things that MACE looks into. Thank you very much, Brother Winston, and good to have you as always. Um, yes, it, it one of the things, at, no, so I mentioned in the early days that there were schools that closed, mainly for financial reasons then. There are schools that close and are um, closed and are amalgamated. Um, for, for, for various reasons. One of my understandings is that the school population declined um, to the extent where the Ministry of Education thought that it was not financially viable to have the school there. There's, I am, I am, I'm in the cool hills of Malvern in the Santa Cruz Mountains. There's a school not far from me that has closed. It's a beautiful building. It's a it's a primary school, so it is a large building, and it is just closed and rotting for the same reason that the population um, declined so much that the ministry decided to close the school. I, I um the the Moravian Education Commission looks into things like these, and I am sure. Uh, we do have members on, on our platform listening. I'm sure they have heard you and that they will, um, as long as there is anything that can be done, they would be doing that. But when you have a school that's so small and have so few students, um, that is one of the results. Um, that basically was what happened in the early days too. When the government uh, decreased funding to the schools, the students, were not coming in the numbers in that they were coming that the numbers that existed before and so the school closed so basically that's that's what happens okay thank you okay. Any more questions for Dr. Gar? Okay, I'm seeing a comment here. Let me see if I can read it. Oh, gee. It was something regarding both. Uh, yeah, yes, I uh, think so. Is it's the community. community. Yes. New Eden is the name of the church. Yes, that's where my, my aunties go, New Eden. So I know it quite well. But Bog is the name of the community. Yes. yes. My aunts and cousins go to New Eden. <laughs> there, there's a question above that state um, comment about the Bow community. Oh, yes. Um, is is Moravian history made to be... Oh, Lord. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I was reading from something and it just went out. Okay, let me see. Let me see if I can get it. Is Moravian history made to be part of our syllabus, especially at our tertiary institution, as other denomination dictates at their governing institutions? 
So I think oh. the person was asking if more event history is a part of the curriculum, for example, at Bethlehem. Right. Okay. So Bethlehem is our only tertiary institution, and I can speak about that. I'm, as you heard, vice principal of academic uh, services there. The, 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 the teacher training, well, the, we have teacher training and we have the other parts. For both of these parts of our, of our um, institution, we do courses that are owned by two different examining bodies. One is the um, Teachers Colleges of Jamaica. The other is the Community um, Colleges, Community Council of Community Colleges of Jamaica. I say that to say because the 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 the, the, the programs are owned and the structure of it is determined. We can't do anything about the structure of the program that is importantly shared by other institutions. So for example, there are eight teachers colleges that share the same program. And there are more than eight community colleges that share the same programs that we do. I say that to say, we would not be able to add a Moravian program at the Moravian course, for example, for um, on, on these particular programs. But we have been quite creative. At Bethlehem Moravian College, we do have a course, we call it Moravian Studies, that every single student who enters our doors um, have to do. They, it is not examined because, as I say, we can't we can't add to the program as it exists because it's owned by others. But our students do learn about Moravian history, thanks to Sister Lucinda Peart, who some years ago made the recommendation, and we made it happen. So yes, our students do learn Moravian history at the Bethlehem Moravian um, at the Bethlehem Moravian College. And coincidentally, I share with them um, on the, 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 the involvement of Moravians in education. Um, I'm one of their guest lecturers every year. Wonderful. I, I see a hand there. Um, um, Saverna Chambers, I see your hand, and then we take Bishop Clark afterwards. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gardner, thank you for a rather informative presentation. So much so that you have piqued my interest, specifically as it relates to the MEC. Now, having been in existence for so long, I suspect. Um, the MEC would have prepared some reports, and I wonder how and where one is able to access those reports. The, thank, thank you, Sister Anne. <laughs> Good to have you. The, 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 the Moravian Education Commission reports every year to the, every, every synod, um, makes a report to the synod whenever synod sits as it will this year. And so the, the, the reports can be located in the compiled, there's usually a compilation of the reports um, done after the synod. And so you will be able to access the reports of the Moravian Education Commission in those booklets. So that's that I know is one source of those reports. Uh, Dr. Gardner, thank you very much for enlightening us and give us fresh insights into the legacy that our foremothers and forefathers left for us in the areas of education and religious education slash evangelism. Uh, I would imagine that in those days as well, the church would have had a tremendous impact 
on the community life um, because families would have seen how the church engaged their youngsters so they have passed through the stages of elementary slash primary now primary junior high and how they have turned out to be you know uh, upstanding um, men and women in society and the community would have been very proud of the contribution of the church in those days um, I'm just wondering, when you also mentioned about the school and schooling and uh, the they, um, freed people could go to school, but then they, and Monday to Friday, but then the enslaved could only go to church school. And I remember the fact that the church building was also used for double purpose. I'm just wondering, do you find it today that families and the communities um, are showing that kind of um, appreciation and support for the church in what they have contributed to the building of communities? And how can we help to improve that? Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you very much. You Just, just to remind us, when we speak we, we, this presentation, of, and I mentioned the word formal education, but yes, you, you are so correct, Bishop. The church has been very instrumental in education, um, socially, morally, and, and in so many ways. Because remember, education is not, it's not just what happens inside a schoolroom. So the, the church would have influenced and educated people on how to behave, um, towards their fellow men so that they can, so that the communities have benefited very much from the ways in which Christianity has taught us to be kind to each other, to be loving to each other, to share with those who do not have all of those many ways in which Christianity has educated us to live as a community. And in those early days, the enslaved were not able to go to school. But as the, as the church provided the opportunity through schools which were attached to main stations, then they got more of an opportunity to go to school, especially after emancipation, when, so, when eventually people began to be free. As far as appreciation goes, I think that is one of the reasons um, the Western District Conference, for example, has sought to include this as a part of their lecture series, because perhaps people are not as appreciative. And one of the ways that you can, you can stir appreciation in people is to inform them about what has happened. I am happy to hear that we have learned at least one thing new, I would hope, from this presentation, because the more we talk about and share the ways in which the Moravians have been involved in various aspects of our lives and contributed to nation building, contributed to our communities, is I think, Bishop, one of the ways in which we can foster that appreciation, even if no, we do not sense that it is as uh, where it should be. And so I know that there are many Moravians who are appreciative of what the Moravian church has done for them. I distinctly remember, for example, in the opening service at Littitz, when um, one of the speakers, a, a, a politician, praised the Moravian church heartily for its contribution to his life and his education. So I know that there are a number of us who are really appreciative of us. And there are some of us who can be a little more appreciative. And I think things like this, series like this, can only serve to foster that appreciation as people learn and know more about the ways in which the Moravians have benefited communities and the lives of those in the various communities.
the sad dream? Sorry about that. A comment that was posted a few minutes earlier. <clears throat> Excuse me. Recently, a leader of one of the recently a leader of one of the established denominations was concerned that the Ministry of Education seems to be on a path of removing symbols relating to Christianity from the schools. Are we being pressured into removing these symbols from our schools? I am not aware of that. I am actually in the school system. I am an administrator in the school system. I really haven't heard about it. So if it is new, it has not reached my ears at the, as yet. And so I, I, I would be very surprised that this is happening and those of us in the system has not really heard about it. So I would say, no, it's not being, it is not, it's not happening, certainly not on a wide scale. And so I would say, no, we are not being pressured to remove our symbols. We certainly have not been asked at Bethlehem Moravian College. And having been in communication with people from, for example, the Moravian Education Commission, it has not come up in any of our discussions. So I, 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 am, I am not going to say an outright, no, I'm simply going to say, I have not yet heard that that is the case. And just let me respond to the Bogue issue. The, I'm told that the church was initially called Bogue. Now we know that the New Eden Church is not where it was originally. It moved. And so it was when it was moved to its current location that it was called New Eden and told it was called Bogue when it was in its previous location. Thank you so much, Dr. Gardner. Any more questions, brother, brothers and sisters? All right, if there be no further questions, we want to thank you so much, Dr. Gardner, for your insight, for your quick responses to the questions for the reminder of our, how rich our history is and that we should be very proud as Moravians of our history in education. We will now go to Sarah. We'll now ask Reverend Ricardo Malcolm to do the plants for this event. Reverend Ricardo. Good, Good evening, evening, brothers, brothers and, 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 and gentlemen. And, uh, indeed, a uh, wonderful presentation. Let me, on behalf of the staff members of the Western District Conference and the executive members of the Western District Conference, uh, explain our sincere thanks to everyone who contributed to this evening's lecture series, um, contributed to make it possible. To Dr. Sharon Gardner, who accepted our invitation and shared with us a wealth of knowledge of the contribution of the Moravian Church to the development of the educational advancement of Jamaica. Indeed, it was a well, um, it's excellent presentation and uh, we all learned something from it. Ms. Andrew Griffith Malcolm, who guided us through the evening event ably. We thank you, Ms. Mrs. Raksani Pizer, who gave a splendid introduction of our guest presenter, Pastor Alwyn Brooks, who led us in our praise and worship session earlier 
two brother, Louis and Louis, who will pray the prayer for teachers to the planners of this event, um, led by Brother Okil Brown. Also, to you, the audience, who lent us your ears, um, thus fulfilling the purpose for this lecture series. We thank you very much and pray God continued blessing upon us all as we seek to continue to serve God in this part of our vineyard. We have a, a lovely history which we all should be proud of and should continue to add it to the legacies that we have inherited. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Malcolm. We now ask Brother Lewin Lewis to pray on behalf or pray for the schools and teachers. Good night, brothers and sisters. Let me also add my bit of congratulations to Dr. Gardner for a well-presented lecture. I've learned so much from it. And um, I'm sure as the days go by, we'll be able to share with other persons. Let us pause then for prayer as we pray for our schools and we pray for our teachers. Master Teacher Jesus, we come to you this evening on behalf of all our educational institutions in Jamaica and by extension the world. We want to specially place into your loving care all persons who work within these institutions. We pray for your continued leading on their lives. We pray that their lives will bring hope and inspiration and peace to all those whom they interact with. In these challenging times, Lord, we pray that you'll give them the wisdom to teach as they are required to teach. We pray, Lord, that you will give them the strength and the courage to face the foes that sometimes push back at them. We pray, Almighty God, that you will continue to inspire them as they do their tasks from day to day, in spite of the negatives, in spite of the odds that are thrown at them, Lord, we pray that you will give them the strength to stand up to it. As we pray for our teachers, Lord, we also ask you to be close to all our students who share in the teaching and learning process with these teachers. Let them be inspired by you, the great teacher. Help them, Lord, to keep a focus on you as you give them the confidence to carry out all their cares and all their challenges, to bring them to you with the full knowledge that you will always supply their many needs. Let your characteristic of peace and joy and hope continue to be the hallmark of all our teachers. Let them be humble, Lord, Brother Lewis, you are muted. All the way through? Rev? No, just the last oh, one. No, no. We were hearing you before. 
So Lord, I pray that you will allow your, your, your light, your joy and your peace to reign continuously among all of our teachers. We pray for them to be humble, Lord, humble enough to listen to you and to hear you. And having heard what you say to them, Lord, let them be good stewards and do it. So I pray, Almighty God, that you will continue to supply their many needs. I pray, Almighty God, that you will continue to unite their hearts. And may your name at all times be hallowed in all that they do or say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Lewin. We will now have closing him. We will have the prayer and benediction by our Bishop Stanley Clark. Let us pray. Thanks for the invitation to share. God, we pray your blessing on our people, your people. We thank you for those who have given of themselves and of their talents and resources to lay the foundation for others less fortunate than themselves, to have access to education, religious education, spiritual nurturing, 
caring, how they should shape and build their families, how they should live in communities, and how they can contribute to the development of their nation. We thank you, Lord, for those who have used their skills to make life better for others. Thank you, Lord, for our teachers. We pray for your continued blessing upon them, that they will continue to serve, even though at times they might feel as if, well, what is all this for? Grant them, Lord, to know that what they do is not in vain, especially when they do it as unto you and for those little ones who are just waiting to be fed by them. Thank you for this session, Lord. Thank you for our sister who have given us of this lecture. Lord, as we continue to reminisce and think about the goodness of God and how you, Lord, through your grace and mercy and love, have allowed your people to give back for the good of others. We just want to praise you and worship you and give you all the honor and honor praise. Hear us now, Lord, as we pray. And what we fail to do, Lord, over the years, inspire us and others coming after us to do what is left to be done. To your praise and to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. 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 Thank you, friends, for joining, and I wish for you a good night, and we will continue our lecture next year, 2025, God's willing. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank and thank you, you very much for the opportunity. Good, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Brother Winston is still keeping young man. Man, I try and trying to keep up with you, man. <laughs> trying and succeeding. <laughs> blessings, blessings to all of you, man. Glad to be a part of this. Thanks, yeah, Reverend right. Gardner. Yeah. Yes, it's 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 sister Gardner. I just I um I'm not Reverend. Pro pro <laughs> oh, prophecy, oh. prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. Yes, it's oh. <laughs> Prophecy. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing very well. It's so good to have you as always. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. My my dear hey. sister-in-law always feed me with these links. Even when I don't know what was going on, she keep me up to date. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Good to see you, Brother Winston. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Paul here. Yeah. Who is that? Paul, Paul. Oh, okay. How you doing, man? 